In this video, we're going to talk about the chain rule. The chain rule gives us a way to differentiate a composition of functions when the composition is defined. So throughout this lecture, when we talk about the chain rule, assume the functions are differentiable, we have nice functions, and the composition is defined. For the examples we do, these two properties will be satisfied. We're going to look at two contexts for the chain rule. So there's a generalized chain rule when you're working with, say, vector-valued functions of multiple inputs, but we're just going to look at two specific cases. So for the first context, suppose r is a vector-valued function of one variable. In other words, suppose r is a parametric curve. And suppose that f is a scalar-valued function of n inputs. So here I'm making precise that the domain of f is some subset a of rn. Then the composition f of r of t begins in the domain of r, goes to rn, and that's because when we do the composition f of r, the first function's action is the one on the right. So our vector-valued function r takes us from t values to rn, where here I'm assuming that the parameter for my curve is t. Assuming that this composition is defined, we've landed in the domain of f, and then f is going to take us from rn back to scalars. So f is a map from rn to r. So overall, the composition is a map from r to r. In other words, f of r of t is a function like y equals f of x. It's a scalar-valued function of one input. The composition is just a function of one variable, t. So when we differentiate it, it's not a partial derivative, it's just regular differentiation with respect to t. And the chain rule tells us that this is derivative of the outside. Our notion of derivative of the outside is the gradient of f. Evaluated on the inside means just evaluated on the parametric curve r of t. Dot, the derivative of the inside is r prime of t, that's the velocity vector. Classically, the chain rule tells us that the differentiation of a composition is the derivative of the outside evaluated on the inside times the derivative of the inside. So while it looks different, this is the same type of chain rule that you've seen before. Dimensionally, it makes sense because the gradient of f, a function of n variables, is going to be a vector with n coordinates, where each coordinate is, of course, a partial derivative of f with respect to one of the inputs. And then the velocity vector is also a vector with n coordinates. After taking the dot product, the result is a scalar, which is what we would expect because really we're differentiating a function which overall is a scalar valued function of one variable. Let's look at two examples. In the first example, let r of t be the parametric curve t cosine of t, t sine of t, for t values between 1 and 4, and then let f of x and y be the scalar valued function f of x and y equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. You should recognize what both of these objects would trace out in space, so this is a nice way to check whether or not you're visualizing these kinds of quantities correctly. Cosine of t sine of t would be the unit circle, but the coefficient of t in front of each term tells us that the radius is changing, so this is like a spiral or at least a small part of a spiral in R2. On the other hand, what is the graph of z equals f of x and y? Well, that's the part of the equation z squared equals x squared plus y squared that satisfies that z is greater than or equal to zero. In fact, it's the upper cone. We are going to compute the derivative of the composition f of r of t with respect to t two different ways. The first way is actually going to be easier that will be to compute the composition so that we have f of r of t looking like a regular scalar value function of one variable, and then we'll just differentiate it. And then we'll check that we get the same answer with the chain rule. After we've done all of that algebraic computation, I'll show you a picture of what's going on. So method one will be to compute the composition manually. We'll give that a name, so let's just call that g of t equals f of r of t so that we recognize we're looking at a regular single variable function. 
and then we'll just differentiate to compute g prime of t. Okay, so what is g of t? Well, we're going to take f, which is a function of two inputs, but we're evaluating f along the curve. So the first input is t cosine of t, and the second input is t sine of t. So that's going to be f of r. Now we plug those coordinates into our description for f, so it's square root of the first coordinate squared plus the second coordinate squared. So that's going to be the square root of t squared cosine squared plus t squared sine squared, which is the square root of t squared. The square root of t squared is the absolute value of t, but here we're looking for t values between 1 and 4, so it's actually just going to be t. That's a very easy function to differentiate, g prime of t is 1. In other words, d dt of f of r of t is just 1. Now we're going to recompute this derivative of 1 using method 2, which is the chain rule. So we'll compute the gradient of f evaluated on r of t and dot that with the velocity vector r prime of t. Let me first evaluate the gradient of f in general, and then we'll plug in r of t. That's going to be 1 half x squared plus y squared to the negative 1 half times 2x. And similarly, 1 half x squared plus y squared to the negative 1 half times 2y. Okay, we can cancel the 1 halves and the 2s. Now let's evaluate the gradient on t cosine of t, t sine of t x squared plus y squared is going to be t squared cosine squared plus t squared sine squared, so that's t squared. We'll take that and raise it to the negative one-half power, and then times t cosine of t for x, with a similar expression for the second coordinate. Since t is positive, the square root of t squared is t, so then t squared to the negative one-half is going to be 1 over t, that's going to cancel out the coefficients of t, and we're left with cosine sine. Now let's differentiate our parametric curve to compute the velocity vector r prime of t. Here we need the product rule in each coordinate. The first one is going to be cosine t minus t sine t. The second coordinate is going to be sine t plus t cosine t. Now we take the dot product of the gradient of f evaluated on r together with r prime of t to get the rate of change of our composition with respect to t. So let's see, we'll get cosine squared minus t sine cosine plus sine squared plus t sine cosine. Two of the terms cancel out, leaving us with cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. Okay, so the chain rule gave us the same result as we got with method one. Looking at this, you might say, when would I ever want to do the chain rule? And in this particular example, I do agree that evaluating the composition and then differentiating that computation is easier than using the chain rule, but that's not always the case. So sometimes the chain rule is actually advantageous. Let me show you a picture of what this looks like. So we'll see the spiral. It's just a little piece of that spiral and also the upper cone. Here's a graph of what we just did. So you see the upper cone, which is the graph of z equals f of x and y. So z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. And then if we think of the floor of this picture as the xy plane embedded in R3, I've sketched the parametric curve r of t. So that's the curve t cosine t, t sine t for t values from one to four. And then we evaluate f on that parametric curve. And what we've done is compute the derivative of that composition. So on the cone, I've plotted a curve of the form t cosine t, t sine t, t, where that third component is f evaluated along the curve. So what we're saying is as we trace out our parametric curve r of t, the rate of change of our composition is 1. In other words, with respect to the parameter t, the z coordinate of that curve graphed on the cone changes at a rate of 1. Let's look at the second example, and we will only use the chain rule here. 
So let r of t be 4 cosine t, 3 sine t, t squared. So that's a parametric curve whose graph is in R3. And let f be a scalar value function of three variables given by f of x, y, and z is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. We can't graph this function because the graph of this function would be in R4. Let's compute the rate of change of the composition f of r of t, which is actually a function from r to r, using the chain rule. So that derivative is going to be the gradient of f evaluated along the curve dotted with the velocity vector r prime of t. For that first expression, what I'm going to do is compute the gradient in general, and then I'll specify that we're going to evaluate it along the curve. So in general, the gradient is 2x, 2y, 2z. But now we're going to plug into that r of t. And then our velocity vector is negative 4 sine of t, 3 cosine of t, 2t. Evaluating f along the parametric curve gives 8 cosine t for the first coordinate, 6 sine t, 2t squared. And then we dot that with the velocity vector. So now when we compute the dot product, we're going to get negative 32 cosine t sine t plus 18 cosine t sine t plus 4t cubed. So overall, we can say that this is 4t cubed minus 14 cosine t sine t. I won't compute this composition manually and then differentiate it what we did as method one last time, but you could do it and check that you get the same thing. I do want to emphasize here that f of r of t is a scalar valued function of one variable. In fact, here's its graph. So I've graphed the composition f of r from negative 2 to 2. So you can see this really is just a function of one variable like this. Let's look at another situation which we can evaluate with the chain rule. So here I have a scalar valued function of two variables f of x and y is x squared y plus y cubed, but each of x and y depend in turn on two other inputs s and t. So x of s and t is 6s, and y of s and t is s cubed plus t squared. So f depends on x, which depends mainly on s, and f depends on y, but y depends on s and t. So we can say that f does depend on s and t, even if it's not explicit in our initial description for f. So I like to think of this as a tree. f depends on x and y, but each of those inputs depends on s and t. So if we change s, f would change, and we would like to compute the rate of change of f with respect to s. So that would be the partial derivative of f with respect to s, Likewise, we would like to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to t. This is different from the previous context because here we're starting in R2, going to R2, and then going to R. In other words, from the inputs s and t, we get x and y, and then we evaluate f, and the result is a scalar. So here's how we compute the partial derivative of f with respect to s. First we measure how f changes with respect to x, and then how x changes with respect to s. So that's df dx times dx ds. We add to that df dy dy ds. Similarly, the rate of change of f with respect to t is going to be df dx dx dt plus df dy dy dt. So for this particular example, df ds will be df dx, so that's 2xy, times dx ds, which is 6, plus df dy which is x squared plus 3y squared, 
times dy ds, which is 3s squared. So after simplification, we get 12xy plus 3s squared x squared plus 9s squared y squared. Notice in this expression, we've mixed together s's, x's, and y's. It could also have been t's there. And sometimes that's OK. It depends on the problem. And sometimes you might have a specific moment in time you're interested in where you know the value of s, t, x, and y, and you could just plug it into this formula. Or what we could do is go through and replace x and y with their expressions for s and t. So you could say it's 12 times 6s times s cubed plus t squared plus 3s squared times the quantity 6s squared, plus 9s squared times the quantity s cubed plus t squared squared. OK, let me just write down df dt, and that will be it for this lecture. df dt is going to be the rate of change of f with respect to x. So once again, that's 2xy. It's going to be the same first terms as in the calculation above. Then times dx dt, which is actually 0. And then once again, times df dy, which we've already done, that's x squared plus 3y squared. And then times dy dt, which is 2t. That's it for today's discussion of the chain rule. See you next time.